So just what is a competitive advantage? The Capstone Support Line gets calls from hundreds of different schools, and when we randomly ask students for an example of a competitive advantage, they often have trouble coming up with something concrete. Why is that? Textbooks hit you with a lot of information, so it's easy to think the answer should be complicated. But while getting and keeping a competitive advantage can be a difficult process, it's fairly simple to recognize and understand once you know what to look for. Let's look at a simulation from another school. Here are the top products in the traditional segment for round three. Looking at the segment results, we'll focus on Able and Cake. They're the top two. What product advantages can we see for each? Well, Able outsold Cake by about 250,000 units during the year, so it's got a lot going for it right now. And both products are significantly better than the others in the segment. The next best seller is Sid with 1,273,000 units sold. Now let's drill down to age. The traditional customer wants an age of 2.0 years. We can see that Abel ended the year with an age of 1.8. From what we see, it has a pretty good age profile too. When Abel was revised on May 30th, it must have had a new age of 1.2. That was seven months ago. The day before its revision, its age was 2.4. So it must have started the year with an age of 1.9. Able was very competitive the first five months. While a little young at mid-year, it showed improvement all throughout the latter part of the year. Now, how did Cake do? It was revised on August 22nd, so it must have had a revised age of 1.3 and an age of 2.6 the day before revision. It started the year at 2.0 and ended at 1.7. That's pretty good, though not quite as good as Able. So we see Abel had a slight advantage in age over cake. Nothing dramatic. Looking through other product ages, we see that most are doing a good job of managing their age. The exception is Fist. With an age of 3.2, it is at a significant disadvantage. Now let's roll over to stockouts. Abel and cake are dead even. Neither stocked out. But other products did stock out. This was a huge disadvantage for Sid, Adam, and Fast. Guess what? It doesn't matter how good your product is or what advantages it's won. If you run out, you can't sell it. Moving on to positioning. Abel and Cake's ending positions are almost the same, and by inference, so were their starting positions. But if we look at the perceptual map, we see that both are somewhat behind the ideal spot. This puts them at a small disadvantage relative to products like Eat. And then we have outliers like Adam and Fast. They are at a serious disadvantage. Now what about price? Well, we see that Abel has quite an advantage over Cake. It's $3.50 cheaper, which could explain the sales difference between the two. Looking down the list, most of the prices fall within a dollar of each other. Not much of an advantage or disadvantage. Fast's low price of $19.98 could have made a difference, but it stocked out. Now we'll look at promotion and awareness. Promotion drives awareness, and we see that Cake has a slight advantage over Able. Contrast this with Eat. It's at a significant disadvantage. While it's a decent product with a well-managed age and position and high reliability, at 29% awareness, hardly anyone knows about it, meaning when they go shopping, they won't be looking for it. Accessibility amplifies Eats problems. It's at a paltry 20%. Design isn't the issue either. It's got good design. It's just that of the customers who do know about it, only 20% seem to easily find it. Contrast this with Andrews, Chester, and Digby. They all want to be serious players here in traditional. Now let's make some key observations. So far we've been talking about customers, but what about stockholders, employees, bankers, vendors, and, and other parties? Stakeholder perception can grant considerable competitive advantage to a product. Think about stock and bond holders. We also compete in the capital markets. 
Couldn't competitive advantage come from our ability to raise money? When a stakeholder perceives that a company has more of something the stakeholder wants, that's a competitive advantage, isn't it? It doesn't matter what kind of stakeholder it is. When considering an offer, perceptions like lower price, lower risk profile, credit terms, higher awareness, and so forth will impact a decision and create competitive advantage if a competitor looks like it has more of what is wanted. There are two other considerations. How important is the advantage and how difficult is it to sustain over time? Let's see how they play off of one another. For our traditional customers, age is very important when it comes to buying criteria. But how difficult is it to manage the age? Not very. Even a small advantage creates great opportunity. The problem is we can't expect to keep the advantage for very long. Price is also important. How difficult is it to drop the price? Not very. But price is also related to production costs, and those in turn depend on automation, maybe even TQM initiatives, which take considerable investment. It's one thing to cut the price. It's another to cut the price and still make a profit. So if we looked into streamlining our production capabilities, it's possible that we could get a sustained advantage. Are you seeing how this works? Moving down to positioning, it too is important. How difficult is it to manage? That's an interesting question because it depends on whether we're talking about maintaining a well-positioned product, moving it to another segment, or inventing a new one altogether. Consider a product like Fast. Ferris is sending it to the low end. From the low end customer's point of view, Fast is poorly positioned. It will take a long time for Ferris to fix that problem. How about reliability? It's not very important to this segment. And while it's easy to change, it's also related to material cost. In the traditional segment, price is more important than reliability. In a segment like performance, it's the reverse. Reliability is more important than price. Now let's look beyond buying criteria. What about having multiple products in a segment? In other words, product extenders. Looking at the market share actual versus potential chart, we see that Andrews and Chester dominate the market. How are they doing it? One explanation is they have excellent products. Another is that they have two products in the same segment. Let's do some digging to find out which. Checking out the December customer surveys, Abel and Cake look about equal overall. They're even stronger than many of the other products. But Days will be the biggest seller in January. Its survey results stand at 49 over Abel's 33. So does that mean Digby will dominate the segment next year? Not at all. Remember what I said about product extenders? Andrews is offering two products, Abel and Adam. Chester also has two products, Cake and Sid. Each company outnumbers Digby two to one, and we can expect both companies to improve their products. Andrews and Chester's competitive advantage here is their number of products. It's an advantage that's hard to overcome because it would take years for a company like Digby to bring a second traditional product to the market. Now we'll consider something we don't normally think of as an advantage, inventory availability. Check out the products in the low end segment. Every single one of the major players stock out. And then what happened? Customers were forced to turn to fringe products like Days and Able to get what they wanted. This is a great example of what happens with a capacity shortage. With over a million units, Able made a significant dent in this segment, but it's a terrible low end product. It wasn't until it became the only product available that it was even considered at all. Once an advantaged product stocks out, it takes considerable investment to get it back into production. Now let's look at accessibility in the traditional segment. First, it's difficult to acquire accessibility. For example, it could take Andrews another three years to reach 100%. And today, Andrews, Chester, and Digby already have formidable advantages over Baldwin and Erie. And look at Erie. We know it has a decent product in EAT, but it will take years to correct the problems it has in accessibility and awareness.
not to mention that we'd expect Andrews, Chester, and Digby to continue improving their positions. We'll use this example to segue into several core distinctions of competitive advantage. We've seen what would be called short-term competitive advantage. Changing a product's price or reliability is an example of how this can easily be done. Then there is what we would call sustained competitive advantage. Using Digby as an example, we see how accessibility and awareness work to create sustained competitive advantage. If Erie spends furiously on its sales budget, it might catch up to Digby in a couple of years. But during those two years, Digby will keep pushing, trying to get its accessibility to 100%. It's more realistic to expect Erie to spend furiously for four years before it can neutralize Digby's advantage. But during that time, it will also be suffering from suppressed sales due to its disadvantage. Now, there are three things that you should recognize about sustained advantage. First, a determined competitor can eventually neutralize your advantage. While this is difficult, it is possible. Second, if you can keep your advantage long enough, competitors may just give up, especially if neutralizing the advantage drives away any hope for profitability until they catch up. This is the force behind an industry shakeout. Third, once you achieve the limits of your sustained advantage, it serves as a barrier to entry for new competition. It will take them years to reach parity with you. Now let's move to something called sustainable competitive advantage. It's rare, but when this kind of advantage occurs, it often leads to a monopoly. A great example of this is Windows, the Microsoft operating system. The defining characteristic of a sustainable competitive advantage is that no matter how hard a competitor tries, it can never catch up. There's one place in the simulation where it's possible to gain a sustainable competitive advantage, and that's in human resources, where you can invest in training and recruitment of better qualified workers. Now let's sum it all up. Where is it possible to gain a competitive advantage? Buying criteria, price, positioning, age, and reliability. Awareness and accessibility. Credit terms product extenders, capacity to produce sufficient inventory efficiently. Remember that idle capacity does not produce inventory. Automation, which leads to a cost advantage and lower prices. Human resources, TQM initiatives, which will be introduced in round four. And for the capital markets, lower leverage, which is attractive to bondholders and bankers and higher earnings per share, which is attractive to stockholders. Good luck.